Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're up to the Davidic Covenant, uh, and we're going to take several Sundays to cover this. We'll probably take three Sundays on the Davidic Covenant, and then the last covenant we'll look at is the New Covenant. We'll take about three Sundays on it, so it'll be about six more weeks for this all together. And then our plan after that is to start a survey through the Old Testament. Remember, we talked about how these covenants really kind of provide a framework for understanding the Old Testament. And uh, I hope it also helps you in your personal reading through the Bible. We want to look at some background for this covenant first. We looked, remember, last week at what we call the Deuteronomic Covenant. Uh, Israel had moved up to the plains of Moab. They are about to enter into the Promised Land. Moses has been told that he won't enter the land, so he knows he's about to die. And he uses that as an opportunity to expound to this new generation the Mosaic Law. The Davidic Covenant is going to take place some 400 years after what we looked at last week. Israel failed to completely drive out the inhabitants of the land uh, as God had commanded her to. That's something that's recorded for us, particularly in the book of Joshua. Joshua warned the people that the foreigners who remained in the land would become, quote, a snare and trap to you and a whip to your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from the land which the Lord your God has given you. So this was near the end of Joshua's life. As you read through the book of Joshua, remember that each tribe was responsible to drive out the Canaanites out of their particular allotment of land. And they did that to varying degrees, but nobody did it like they were supposed to. And what ends up happening, instead of Israel completely conquering the Canaanites and their being an influence on the rest of the nations, the nations began to influence them. I'm going to move over here a little bit so I can look at it on the screen. The book of Judges states that after Joshua's generation, there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. And this begins not just a cycle, but a downward spiral of a cycle that was recorded for us, that's recorded for us in the book of Judges. Influenced by the remaining tribes that were in the land and that were continuing to worship pagan gods, Israel herself would become involved in gross sin, uh, particularly in idolatry. The Lord would punish her by allowing her to become uh, subjugated to a foreign power. And what did she do? What do we read about in the book of Judges when that happened? She'd call out to God, and what would God do? And he'd send somebody, he'd send a judge. They would cry out in their oppression, asking God that would deliver to deliver her from her bondage. The Lord would raise up a judge. And what's interesting about the book of Judges in particular is there's not one judge over all the land, but because it's spread out and dispersed in tribal allotments, there are different judges that rise up at different times. Some of them reign together in Israel in different places, but at the same time. But in any case... God would raise up a judge, the judge would deliver the people from their enemies, and they would enjoy peace for some period of time, but then it would all start all over again, and the cycle just continued. And that led to Israel really growing weary of that cycle and asking for a king. Now, if you'll remember from the book of Genesis, and as we were looking at the Abrahamic covenant, one of the promises was that kings would proceed from Abraham and Sarah. So in one sense, that's not an unexpected thing. Was it wrong for Israel to ask for a king at this point? Yes. Why? Because God was their king. Exactly. God was their king. And what, what was their reason for asking for a king? They wanted to be like all the other nations who had human kings that led them in battle and that was their motivation. It was to be like the other nations. And God took it rather personally. You know, as he's interacting with Samuel, he, on the one hand, he's going to grant this request. And it's an interesting question because, you know, we're going to see that eventually there's a promised king, Jesus Christ himself, that's going to make all things right. But it, as you read about it early on, God sees it as a rejection of him as their king. 
he was their king. The priests were kind of the intermediaries between the Lord and the people, but they weren't satisfied with that. And again, I think the book of Judges and that cycle contributed to that. They ultimately wanted a king. Now, how were the judges in the hierarchical leadership? Were they with like a, a, a legal arm of the uh, Sanhedrin? Or, or okay, it's a very good question. We think of judges more in that way as a legal person that decides issues of dispute between people. They did some of that, but the main thing that they did, as you read in the book of Judges, is they were military deliverers. They were leaders of armies or, or leaders in such a way that they were able to gain freedom from these foreign oppressors. So they were like generals? They're like generals in many ways. Um, it's fair to say they didn't have a divided government, they didn't have an executive government. They did not have at this point. Remember, before they had the judges, they had a theocracy. God was the king. The priests were really the highest human uh, part of the hierarchy. And they were to teach people the law. They were to offer sacrifices for the people. They were the leaders. The priests still had that position as judges were raised up. But the judges were raised up primarily as um, deliverers, as another way. I think the term judges even is a little bit misleading. Uh, as far as what their function was. That's right, yeah. They did do a little bit of the other kind of judging, but they were primarily uh, military deliverers. Oh, let me back up. So Saul was the first king. Again, as you read the account, he was, he was chosen by God, and he started off well enough, but he wasn't completely devoted to the Lord. What, what was the evidence of that? There were at least two things that he, what's that? He didn't do what he said. He didn't do what he said, but can you give me a particular instance of? Uh, it was like that one time when he was supposed to wait. The, the that's right. He was, he wasn't supposed to offer the sacrifices. He was supposed to do that. The priest. It was something that was reserved for the priest. Uh, and, and for Samuel in particular, in this case, he was supposed to wait um, for Samuel to come and you know, he felt like Samuel was late and the battle was nearing and he went ahead and, and offered sacrifice. There was something else that he did that's particularly pointed out in the text that was a downfall. Again, it was not doing what the Lord said, but what was the specific act? When, uh, when, when they uh, went into battle, he was supposed to kill everyone and he brought back the That's right. He kept the good stuff. Uh, he, he didn't kill all the Amalekites. He didn't especially didn't kill Agab, who's the king of the Amalekites. So, uh, you know, as you read Samuel's defense of these things, he even comes up with what sounds like good reasons, right? You know, we, we kept the best of the sheep and livestock so we could offer sacrifice to the Lord. Well, that's not what God wanted. He wanted obedience uh, rather than sacrifice. So because of Samuel's shortcomings, uh, the kingdom was taken, uh, and sins actually, the kingdom was taken away from him and God chose David, a man that he describes as a man after his own heart. Now if you think about the life of David, uh, he sinned as well, right? I mean, he committed some pretty serious sins. He took another man's wife, he had that man killed, he covered all that up. And yet, he's described here as a man after God's own heart. How do we square that up? What's, what did David do that demonstrated, in spite of all those things that he did that were wrong, Isaiah, what did he do that made the difference? He didn't kill Saul. He didn't return to heal. Okay. Well, he didn't return evil for evil in the case of Saul, right? Because Saul was out to get him, and he didn't. So that was an evidence of recognition that Saul was still God's anointed and he was willing to wait for God's timing before assuming the kingship. What, what else? What else demonstrated that he was a man after God's own heart? Well, he, repented. he repented. I mean, that's... When he was confronted with his sin, he didn't try to explain it away the way that Saul did. He recognized it. His sin had serious consequences, but he recognized it and he sought forgiveness from God. And God forgave him. As I, Isaiah pointed out, Saul was continually seeking to kill David, and David refuses to lay a hand on him. Remember the incident, even when 
David and his men were already in the cave. Saul comes in there not knowing that they're in there. And David is able to sneak up and cut off a piece of his robe even without Saul recognizing. He did a, there was another instance where they were down in the camp and they were all asleep. And I think in that case, David sent men down to get a spear and a jug to show that he could have killed Saul on a number of occasions and he chose not to. David does eventually assume the throne at the age of 30. And after the capture of Jerusalem from the Jebusites and two decisive battles over the Philistine, Philistine, David brings the ark back to Jerusalem. And he's gonna, that's going to be a very significant event in Israel's history because this is going to be the place that David establishes as God's city. This is where the temple is going to be built, and this is where the ark is going to remain after it had been at several different places up to this point. So David establishes this city, the city of Jerusalem, as the center of Israelite worship. Remember, this is over a period of time of 400 years from the time that Israel first enters into the Promised Land. Having been given rest by the Lord from all his enemies and having built a house for himself already, a very fine house of cedar, David now desires to build a house for the Lord. Remember, up to this point, the Ark of the Covenant has been dwelling in a tent. That was a tent that God gave the plan and design for at Sinai. But now David wants, he, he sees the beauty and grandeur of his own house. He sees that the Ark of the Covenant is still dwelling in this tent. And he wants to build a house for the Lord. All right, with that background, let's read the covenant itself in 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 16. You remember the earlier verses there, David has this desire to build the house for the Lord. Uh, Nathan the prophet initially affirms that desire. He says, go and do all that's in your heart. But then God appears to Nathan and, and brings some correction. Let's read now in 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 8. This is the Lord speaking to Nathan the prophet, who in turn is going to speak to David. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. Remember, that's what David was, was just a lowly shepherd. He was the last of the brothers that were brought before Samuel uh, to recognize him as the king. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will, will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you, the, I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Remember? David had wanted to make a house for the Lord. Now he's saying, I'll make a house for you. Now, is he talking about a physical house there? No. David already had that kind of house. When he says he's going to make a house for him, what does he mean? It's the same word in Hebrew, but just as in English, different words in different contexts have different meanings. The same word in different contexts have different meanings. A dynasty. A dynasty, a lineage. That becomes clear as we continue to read. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. Who is that descendant? Okay, oftentimes people say Christ. Uh, what is another answer? In the context, if you're just looking at the historical context, who is it's Solomon? Solomon's the one that's going to build the temple. And I think if you look at the cross-reference in Chronicles, I, that's where I am in my Bible reading now, it's very explicit that he talks about Solomon. Now, obviously Christ is the ultimate Davidic ruler, and he's the one who leads the kingdom in a way that no other previous Davidic ruler had. But in this context, he's talking about Solomon. That becomes clear as you read verse 13. He shall build a house for my name. He's talking about the physical temple there. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. Now, 
you could read that verse and say, well, isn't that talking about Christ? And again, Christ is in that lineage. He's in that line. But the fact is that David himself and everyone who came to the throne in David's line after him was considered a son of God. He was considered a son of God in the sense that he had that relationship with the Father. And the king was to rule uh, as God's regent on the earth. We're going to look at a couple of psalms that are called royal psalms. And it talks, Psalm 2, for example, says, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. That is not talking in its original context about Christ. It's talking about the new Davidic ruler as he comes to the throne. And, and it's based on this reference back in the Davidic covenant. I was just going to say, and also in the end of 14, it wouldn't say, he wouldn't say about Christ if he commits iniquity. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So he says here, I'll be a father of him and he'll be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I'll correct him with the rod of men. I'll discipline him and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Now remember, God chose Saul, but he also took the kingdom away from Saul. David is going to end up well, Solomon, as David's son, is going to end up committing a sin that divides the kingdom. I mean, it's a serious sin. He was led away by foreign wives to worship other gods. And, and ten of the twelve tribes went to the northern kingdom. This promises to the southern kingdom. So there is discipline, but there's never a complete forsaking of this covenant that God is making with David. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So, this passage we can divide up into two promises or sets of promises. Some were going to be fulfilled in David's own lifetime, and some will go way beyond his lifetime and will be fulfilled after his death. First, it says, God says in verse 9, that he's going to make a great name of David. Now, where have we heard that before? Abraham. Abraham. So you start to see some of the themes, and I'll show a chart later, that are connecting these covenants. Just as God promised to make a great name of Abraham, in contrast to men who tried to make a great name for themselves with the Tower of Babel, he's promising that same thing here with David. He's promising a place for the people. What is that place? It's Israel. It's the promised land. We've seen that promise already in the Abrahamic covenant. And we've seen it uh, given great detail in the Mosaic covenant. Um, it is the same place that he's promising to David for the people. He's also promising rest. Now, when I think he's, when he says rest here, I don't think he's saying, okay, you guys don't have to work anymore. I'm going to do everything for you. You can just relax and enjoy yourself. What does he mean by rest here? Peace. Peace. Peace from enemies. The, uh, David has been doing a lot of that already in fighting enemies. And in fact, he, there's a certain measure of peace that's already there. But he's promising an ongoing, enduring peace. Well, this, like we said, this is something that, that he had to some degree already in his own lifetime. Where have we heard that promise before? promise of peace from enemies. The Deuteronomic, the Deuteronomic Covenant, which is a renewal of Mosaic. Mosaic Covenant. Remember, one of the promises of blessing in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy was peace from the enemies. And again, I just want you to see how the themes of the covenants tie together. All right? So those are three significant promises that were going to be fulfilled in David's own lifetime. What about after his death? He promises to build a house for him. And as Frank said, this, this was a dynasty, a lineage, uh, a series of kings that would come through David's line. He also promises a particular seed or descendant. And again, we've seen that uh, a multitude of descendants that are promised as part of the Abrahamic covenant. This is talking about a descendant, a son uh, that we know as Solomon, who would build the house for the Lord. There's also the promise of an everlasting kingdom. And again, 
in contrast to Saul, from whom the kingdom was taken away, and in contrast to the northern kingdom, this was a kingdom that would always remain in the line of David. So the essence of the Davidic covenant, God provided promise to give David a great name and under his leadership as king to provide a secure place for the nation of Israel to dwell in. And all this is again in accordance with the promises that were previously made in the Abrahamic covenant. Yahweh also promised that the descendant of David would build a temple and that David himself had wanted to build and that the Davidic dynasty would endure forever. If you want to summarize in one sentence what the essence of the Davidic covenant is, is that David would never lack a man to sit upon the throne of Israel. I've got three scripture references there. I want to read those just so you hear <clears throat> that promise made. 1 Kings 8.25 Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that, that which thou hast promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your sons take heed to their way to walk before me as you have walked. And Second Chronicles 6.16 says virtually the same thing. Notice there's a an element of conditionality there. The kings are responsible to walk according to the ways of the Lord. Uh, a lot of people want to say that the Davidic covenant is unconditional in the same way that the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. I just don't think that's a good way to think about these covenants. There's always responsibility on man's part. There's always certainty on God's part. He's going to make sure his covenants are fulfilled because he's the one that's making them. But that doesn't preclude the fact that there are responsibilities on man's part as well. Jeremiah 33, 17, Thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And then in another scripture that we've looked at a couple of times already, Jeremiah 33, 20 through 21, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, that's the, the Noahic covenant, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. Notice in 2 Samuel 7, the word covenant is not even used. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that it's not a covenant. We're going to look at Psalm 89 in a couple of weeks, and it clearly calls it a covenant with David. But it's a little different in that the, the other passages that we've looked at, that word covenant is used with the other covenants, that is. Okay. What about the fact that after Israel, or after Judah, is taken into exile, there's no longer a king in Israel? How do we square that up with the Davidic promise, or the promise to David? Does Israel have a king today? There's so many women just not that that's, that's right. And that's what the promise is, right? Is that neighbor would never like a man to sit upon the throne. It doesn't say that the throne itself would never be interrupted. It has been interrupted. It's been interrupted as people have been taken into exile. But, and I'll show this in a chart later, as Donna said, the seed, the promise of the seed continuing down uh, was not interrupted. And in fact, there is a man ready to sit upon the Davidic throne today. Who is that? It's Christ. He's not on the Davidic throne right now. He's on his Father's throne in heaven at the Father's right hand. The Davidic throne has always been in Jerusalem, and that's from which the place from which Christ will reign when he comes back. So can I ask a question? Sure. Would you say that after Jesus, like, is there somebody right now that's in the third line of David that exists currently that well, could be a king? Or are you saying that after Jesus, there's no longer a need of somebody else? I would say, I would say the Davidic, the promise of the Davidic covenant continued down to Christ, and and He and is the man. It for that's, that's right. And Jesus had no children. So. He had no children. The whole point of the genealogy in Matthew one is to show that Christ not only is the son of Abraham, He has to be that, but He also that He's the son of David. That's the main emphasis in Matthew one. So. Matthew is writing to Jews to try to convince them that this Jesus is the Christ that was promised by the Old Testament and he shows that genealogy to show that he's descended from David. So when it says that it won't lack a man sit on the throne ever, you're just saying that Jesus became from then on the eternity of it. Whereas there's not, it's not that there's other people 
so there, there, there were other people from the time that the throne disappeared during the exile down to Christ. That line was preserved. But once it came to Christ, there's nobody after that. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this diagram shows there was a single united kingdom for about 112 years that included Saul, David, and Solomon. And then because of Solomon's sin in 931 BC, it split into the northern and southern kingdom. Ten tribes went to the north. They established a new city there um, in Samaria. And they, they had no good kings that followed in that line. The other thing about the northern kingdom is it didn't stay in one family. There were different families that came to the throne in the north. The southern kingdom is the kingdom from which the tribes of uh, Judah and Benjamin came. Um, that is the line of David. And every king that came to the throne, even though there were plenty of bad ones there, uh, 11 bad and, and only 8 good, every one of them was descended from David. That throne, uh, you remember that the, the northern kingdom was taken into captivity in 722 B.C., Southern Kingdom, three different stages of captivity. 605 was when Daniel and his three friends were taken. That started the clock for the 70 years of captivity. 597 was Ezekiel and 10,000 others. And then 586 was when Jerusalem was completely destroyed. They're in captivity for 70 years. In 538, Cyrus uh, issues a decree that allows them to go back and first rebuild the temple and then the city of Jerusalem. And just as there were three stages of captivity, there were also three returns led by Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Now, as we said, that southern kingdom is the line of David. Every single king that came to the throne in the southern kingdom was from his family. And that line, even after exile in 586 B.C., continued all the way down to the time of Christ. We talked about the common themes between the different covenants. In this case, it's usually, well, it's between the Davidic covenant and references to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis, also some to the Mosaic covenant down in Exodus 4, or at least some similarity of references in the book of Exodus to what we're looking at in 2 Samuel 7. We've already talked about the fact that there was a promise of being uh, having a great name just as there was to Abraham. The land inheritance uh, was spelled out in several times in the Abrahamic covenant. Also in Deuteronomy 11 and Joshua 1, there was a reminder that the land was part of the promise of God and it was the stage upon which these covenant blessings were, was going to come. Descendants are promised in the Abrahamic covenant on multiple occasions. Uh, it's also promised there in the Davidic covenant. The concept of sonship. We already talked about how the Davidic king was considered son of God. There's a place in Exodus 4 where God says this. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. What is the, what's the point of that kind of metaphor between God and Israel and God and Israel's king? Why, do you, why does he call them his son in each case? He cares for them, he protects them. I think it just indicates the closeness of relationship between God and and these two different parties, the nation as a whole and the king. And of course, when Christ comes, he comes as God's son as well. So that's even yet another place, not mentioned in the Old Testament here, but another place that indicates the closeness of relationship between the father and the son. All right, we've been looking at the connections between the covenants. Over the next couple of weeks, what we'll do is look at what are called royal psalms, sometimes they're called messianic psalms, and they spell out this relationship between uh, the father and his son that rules on the throne. They focus on the Davidic dynasty 
and they depict the king as one who rules according to the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant. Remember, that's what the king was responsible for. He was to know the law himself, he was to keep the law, and he was to model keeping the law for the rest of the people. 2 Kings 18 through 23 is the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant that provide the measuring stick for the reigns of Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Josiah. Again, the two things that you see measuring whether or not a king was good or bad was one, whether or not they walked in the ways of their father David, and two, whether or not they kept the law and led the people in keeping the law. Grisani uh, was one of Matt and my seminary professors. He wrote an article on the Davidic covenant. The proper role of the Davidic king was to lead his people in keeping Torah. That again, that's spelled out. We looked at this last week. Well, I don't know if we talked about it when we looked at it. But Deuteronomy 17, even before they have a king, the, the requirements of that king are, are spelled out. He was not to multiply horses so as to depend on the army rather than on God himself. He was not to multiply gold and silver, and he was not to uh, marry foreign women. And the reason being is that those, those foreign women would lead them away to worshiping their gods. Well, as you read in the account of Solomon in 1 Kings kind of chapters 9 through 11, chapter 11 in particular, he violated all three of those. And that's what led to, to his downfall and to the division of the kingdom. What about connections between the Davidic and New Covenant? We, we won't look at the New Covenant for a couple more weeks, but we can still look at these connections. The New Covenant brings to full realization the various promises of the preceding covenants. That will become more clear when we get there. But the New Covenant is the one in which Israel becomes the nation that she was designed to be according to the Mosaic Covenant. It's the one in which the law of God is written on her heart rather than on tablets of stone. It's the one in which the, the ultimate Davidic ruler will lead the nation. In contrast to only a remnant knowing the Lord, which is the way it's been through all of Israel's history up to this point, the, all the house of Judah and the house of Israel will know him. That's what Jeremiah 31, 34 says. So even the tribes that went away to the northern kingdom are reunited under the Davidic covenant, or the new covenant. God's law will be written on the hearts of the people. He will be their God and, and they will be his people. Jeremiah 31, 33. Israel will be reunited into one kingdom led by one perfect Davidic ruler. And again, that's why so much stress is made on Christ being of the tribe of David. Uh, both in genealogy of Matthew 1, also in the references in the book of Revelation. It's the line of the tribe of Judah. No question? Okay. Okay, so next week we'll look, I don't know if we'll be able to look at all three of those in one week or not, but we'll at least probably read one of those for our psalm reading in the first hour, and we'll look at uh, a couple of these that it really helps to have this understanding of the Davidic covenant in the background as you read this psalm. And you'll we'll see that even in the Old Testament, they were, with each man that came to the throne, looking for that ultimate Davidic ruler. Now, it becomes clear as they keep going through their history that uh, that, that Davidic ruler has not yet come. I mean, the one that is going to really fulfill the promises of the prophets they're still looking for. But <clears throat> the expectation is there, not with some very distant Davidic ruler, but with each one that comes to the throne. Okay, are there any questions about the Davidic covenant? That's a good point. You know, we talked about the the only thing this one has really is the 
the promise of God Himself through the prophet Nathan. So there's no sign to the Davidic covenant like there has been with the Abrahamic and the Mosaic. And there's really no covenant ceremony the way that there was when God walked between the, the sacrificed animals. Um, I think in this case, it's a direct commitment between God and David, and it's just something that's affirmed in those other scripture references that we read, uh, both in Kings and in the Prophets. So the short answer is no, there's not anything like that. Well, Do Jewish people not think God like kept his promise true or whatever? Like how do they back after So my understanding is that they certainly they they believe the Old Testament, they know that they were taken into exile, they they recognize at least the ones that live today that they've been brought back into the promised land. What they don't believe is that their Messiah has come. Uh, we know that that's true because we believe the New Testament. They don't accept the New Testament. They don't accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And the thing that's particularly hard for them is, based on their reading of the Old Testament, they don't see how somebody who was hung on a cross and crucified could possibly be the king. It just doesn't square up for them. So they're still looking for their Messiah to come the first time. Now. So that's just bigger than the one we saw. That's right. So they're still thinking there's somebody in the lineage. Exactly. That's, that's right. So they still honor David. You know, they they still believe that the Messiah will come through David's line, but they don't think it came through Christ. And of course, if you don't if you don't accept the New Testament, then you could see where you would still have that gap and that expectation. That's the first thing when I talk to a Jewish person, especially somebody one that knows the Old Testament, I ask them if, have you read the New Testament? And have you read Matthew's Gospel? It's written to you. It's written by Jews. Uh, it's written about a Jew. Why don't, why don't you read it? Because that's what will lead them to a knowledge that, and that, that's exactly why Matthew's writing, is to try to convince them that this promised descendant of David is their Messiah. A lot of times the Jews from their childhood are, are pretty much taught to not read the New Testament because they just don't believe it's true. What will happen eventually, and we talked about this before, is that in the present day, Israel has been hardened. They won't, as a nation, accept their Messiah. I mean, we can see the very thing that Paul talks about in Romans 11 uh, worked out in the world today. But there'll be a time after God takes them through the tribulation period in which God turns the lights on for them and they recognize that Jesus is their Messiah. Well, it's right now they don't have any, they don't have a temple. They don't have any sacrifice. That's right. So they really they don't have the priesthood. They don't have priests. So they, they really have a hard time you know, making up stuff about, you know, our sacrifice is money, basically, and our priests are, you know. So they, they really, they kind of just cobble the religion together to keep it going. Um, I guess. That's right. I mean, they they largely, because of the absence of those things, they can't keep the law. Now, they try to keep it as much as they can, right? They they still observe the Sabbath, which we talked about was a very important part of the Mosaic Covenant. They still will observe the food laws. But a big part, uh, as far as worshiping the temple and the priesthood and all those things, they can't do. And they can't do by God's design. He's the one that took that away from them in 70 A.D. That's, that's high in the it's what? That's how Antichrist is going to succeed. Exactly. Because That's right. Because he's going to be That's what I was going to say. Is you got a large, a large number of Jews, I think, have given up and think, you know, they don't think about God at all. But a large number also are waiting for the day when right. they've got the, my understanding is they've got a lot of them in war and ready to go. And then, to Frank's point, somebody can step in really easy and fill that gap and kind of deceive them. Exactly. Them. And that's the way the Bible describes it, is that. The one that will initiate is the prince of the people who is to come will initiate this covenant that allows Israel to be restored. There will be a, a new temple built at some point, and there will be uh, worship of that false Christ. Now, there's got to be a, a subset of that group that, that refuses the mark of the beast, uh, 
and that God whisked away to the wilderness for the last three and a half years of tribulation. Those are all Jews. And of course, the 144,000 will refuse the mark of the beast. But I think it's true that much of the nation will be deceived, along with the rest of the world, in embracing this false Christ. Um, and that's my understanding as well, is that there, there's, there's already a lot of stuff in place in Jerusalem now. And they're, they're trying to find the right animals for the sacrifices. They've been praying for the restoration of the temple ever since it was destroyed, I imagine. And I understand there's some underground work yes. works going on underground trying to get it to the point where they can just get it up. That's right. That's right. Uh, there's a really good book about that. Uh, Coming Millennial Temple, I think it's called. I can't remember the author's name. But he talks about all that stuff in there. Um, okay. We'll, we'll prepare for uh, these psalms for next week. Let me close us in prayer and return thanks for the food and we'll have lunch together. Father, again, we're thankful for the portion of your word that describes this covenant and we see how it runs through the rest of Scripture, both in the Old Testament and with the coming of Christ. We thank you that he is the ultimate Davidic ruler, not only in the line of David as a human being, but a son of God in a way that goes far beyond what the earlier Davidic kings were. And we thank you that he has the power and the ability to lead the nation of Israel and indeed the whole world in keeping your law. We thank you for the hope that we have of being part of that, already being in Christ and looking forward to that coming of his kingdom and his rule over the earth of peace and righteousness it's way different from the world that we live in now. So we look forward to that, Father, and we thank you for enabling us to be part of that uh, kingdom. Thank you for the time that we've had together this morning and the time we have together now at lunch. Thank you for those that work to prepare the food for us. And we pray that you would bless it and use it to nourish us today. In Christ's name, amen.